Huskers handle Purdue. Chris Schmidt here with the Average Joe Sports Show. Mitch Sherman here. We're going to talk about the Nebraska quarterbacks. Hi, it's Bill Dolman. Thank God Nebraska cares about special teams again. And speaking of special teams, Bill, Tommy Hill makes a big play, but he's been making big plays everywhere. Let's talk about his development this season. Episode 13 is here. It's the Average Joe Sports Show. Chris Schmidt along with Mitch Sherman and Bill Dolman. Elijah Herbal. Fellas, you look at a lot of things and oh, wait, oh wow, it's a unbeaten October and Nebraska able to beat Purdue 31-14. Who'd have thought Nebraska would, uh, would get through October unscathed? I've been making reservations for Indianapolis for weeks now. You just want to go to St. Listen, <laughs> listen to me. I'm telling you. I'm not surprised you at just, all. You, just, you got like blocks of rooms all over the place. You just continue for weeks to make reservations. You buying up the whole town? There was, what's going on here? There was plenty of availability for Nebraska fans back when I made the investment. Uh, they were not anticipating this. Uh, the rush of orders that are going to be coming in. I, how about Matt Rule working as his own publicist in the in the post-game press conference after the win against Purdue? He, he enlightened the audience with the, the, the revelation that it was Nebraska's first unbeaten October in 2020, 22 years. I mean, who needs who needs Keith Mann these days? <laughs> R- R- I mean, rule the next thing you know, he's going to be uh, typing out the game notes on his laptop and <laughs> arranging interviews and uh, I don't know, moving setting people. it up, shutting it down. Well, right. I'm I'm sitting here in this studio and I'm like, is that true? And I'm I'm going back and doing the fact checking. Yeah, Matt rolls on it before I was, which he, he's going to be taking my job here, running the board on on afternoon radio shows. He can do it all. All right, let's let's uh, take another trip down memory lane. Remember when Nebraska won? The, the first national championship under Tom Osborne, defeating Miami in the Orange Bowl. They fly back from Miami. There's a huge gathering of people from the Lincoln Airport all the way to the Devaney Center, and they have this impromptu national championship celebration. Thousands of people are there. And Tom says, uh, you know, thank you very much for coming and uh, waiting. I guess you've been waiting uh, about 22 years for a night like this. 22 years waiting for a national championship. Now we're in the era of waiting for 23 years to go unbeaten in the month of October. That's where Nebraska football is for the time being, but at least it's on the upswing. Hey, we're one win away. We. We as in the media who wants to go to a bowl game. So <laughs> we, <laughs> Not scoop in December. We're one Nebraska win away from getting a bowl trip. And who would have thought? I mean, you talk about just the difference in eras and, and going 22 years without a national championship seems like a long time until you've gone 22 years without, a, without an undefeated <laughs> October. Who would have thought we'd have been in a position where you wait seven years just to get to a bowl game? And any bowl game at this point, I think, would be enticing for Nebraska. But it's fun. It's fun to be in a press box again where there are conversations among the writers and the broadcasters about, oh, you know, Las Vegas – would be a good place to go the week before Christmas? Or what about Phoenix or New York, Yankee Stadium? That would be a, a different kind of environment. And these are the kind of conversations that, you know, for people of of your generation, Elijah, have ne- you've never experienced these kind of conversations, at least, um, you know, not not since the Bo Pelini years. And, and you know, at that, in the, at that stage, I mean, what, you were in high school, so who knows if you were even having those conversations. But I, yeah, that was October, November, those were the kind of talks that just just filled the air, you know, as the as the cold air set in in the press boxes, and and it's been enjoyable to be able to have some of those talks again. It, and maybe I'm misremembering because I was I was just a young lad, but I feel like I remember in the Journal Star every single I can't remember if it was Sunday or Monday there'd be a a preview of what bowl games Nebraska could be going to this year. So there'd be the Sun Bowl. It's in this stadium in Tempe, Arizona. And here's a rundown on who sponsors it and everything, projected matchup. I, maybe I'm misremembering, but I feel like I remember seeing that, but it's been so long that it's, I don't know. It's, it's always been a topic. It was always a topic of conversation about the p- potential bowl destinations, except in the years where it was just expected that Nebraska was going to go to Miami. And that goes, you know, that goes way back into the, into the eighties, but in, and and nineties to some degree. But, uh, you know, in the in in the 15 years before this drought began, are they going to San Diego? Are they going to go to Nashville? Are they going to go to Orlando or Jacksonville? And and we just haven't been able to have those conversations have been replaced by, well, 
who are they going to get for the new offensive coordinator? <laughs> or who's going to be the next head coach? And it's, I got to say, it's kind of it's kind of refreshing. It's kind of nice to not have to talk about those things here um, as we get to Halloween. Do you remember back in the day, though, when in, in the press box, sorry to jump on you there, Chris, but uh, yeah, when the uh, the bowl representatives and their bad blazers would be walking through the press box and they, they handing, out, handing out their, their pens and uh, whatever little swag that they had to give you, you know, as a teaser for what swag you would get when yes. you actually went to that bowl game. But you'd see somebody from the Cotton Bowl. You'd see somebody from the Fiesta Bowl. It was always the big bowls. The Orange Bowl guys were always there, but they were always going through the press box and, and letting you know where, you know, where Nebraska might be going and glad handing and doing whatever it is that they do on their junkets that they try to avoid taxes on. Nobody really understood what their jobs were. <laughs> <laughs> show them a good time, show up, hand out. Wear those blazers proudly uh, with the, either the orange or the Fiesta Bowl insignia. That is a, I've never seen that shade of yellow or manila before on a, uh, mm-hmm. on a sports coat. But, uh, man, they, they got a heck of a deal for all the uh, Fiesta Bowl reps. They work well on Halloween. They do. And happy Halloween, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we're right there. I did not tell you where to find us as I got going here on the 13th episode, uh, 13 being appropriate for Halloween with the Average Joe Sports Show. Get us on YouTube, the AJ Sports Show. Get us on Twitter, the AJ Sports Pod. Mitch Sherman with The Athletic, Bill Dolman, Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt. Guys, we've dove in, and it is awesome to talk uh, bowl projections. And, One more win for Nebraska is all they need. Four games left, and at uh, Rules Presser today, he was pretty adamant about focusing in and, and the guys not getting too fat and happy. Uh, the the long and short uh, is they are going to trust the process. But from a uh, rewind standpoint, guys, it was a pretty impressive win for Nebraska in the sense they. Workman like jumped out. They got some big plays offensively. Uh, defense was on point, and then they kind of had had to hang on because of familiar problems on offense, and that's taking care of the football. Yeah, fumbles on consecutive possessions in the fourth quarter with a twenty-four point lead is not ideal. And they both came from the quarterback. You know, one the first one, I tend to be a little bit more forgiving because Heinrich Harburg on the play before he fumbled got lit up like nobody's business by a 260-pound pre- 260 Purdue linebacker that who Heinberg, Heinrich did not see coming off the sideline. He, Matt Rule said today that Harburg told him, for all he knew, that guy actually came off the sideline <laughs> and hit him like that. So he knocked him into next week, and in all their wisdom, Nebraska called a run play to the QB on the next snap, and, and Harburg fumbled it away somewhat expectedly, I, I would say. Uh, I don't know if, if, if he even realized where he was when he took that snap. And Purdue scored. Nebraska brought Jeff Sims in because Harburg was on the bench with a bloody mouth, and Sims fumbled it on a fourth down keeper. And not, didn't just fumble it, but he handed it to a Purdue linebacker who took it in for a 55-yard scoop and score, and suddenly it's 24-14 to 14 after it was 24 to nothing just – a few minutes earlier, and the whole stadium, I think, was in shock at that point. But credit to Nebraska, because I think what just would not happen in a previous season is that Harburg came back out, he rallied the team, they went down, they scored the, 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 the touchdown to ice it to make it 31-14. I've seen too many games with this Nebraska program where instead of going down and scoring, they go three and out, give the ball back to the opponent, and then it's a 10-point game, and you're on defense. It was impressive the way they did uh, not get down again. I think we've seen a couple of instances like this. You go back to the Illinois game where you got the lead and you're giving the ball away and you're giving opportunities and you're giving chance and you're giving life and you're giving hope. And then the defense does what it needs to do in order to you know, shut things down, uh, settle it down. And I think being at home certainly helped a little bit. But uh, I thought it was impressive for them to uh, – to not let the circumstances of what was transpiring in the fourth quarter to get them derailed against a team that has a locomotive for uh, a mascot. 
Um, you know, but there, and a running back, but, but really, just the mascot's more important. Yeah, I mean, Nebraska's got to got to be much more uh, careful holding onto that football. Boy, that has been said from the opening uh, plays of this entire season. But it's it, it's amazing how they get the opening kickoff and fumble. Yeah, they, you know, both of them. Special team. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, both. It's, both. It, it's remarkable. Uh, I think everybody needs to wear whatever uh, stick em Fred Bolitnikoff gloves there are that are out there so that nobody drops the ball anymore. Because no, uh, receivers can, must, are making these, you know, uh, outer, out of body catches nowadays because of the, the gloves that, are, uh, that there are. Then why isn't everybody wearing them so that they don't fumble the football? Guys, 24 fumbles for Nebraska through eight games. No other team in the country has even 20. Jeez. Now, those are just fumbles. They've only lost 11. Only, I say. That number also leads the country by just one. But, man, they, uh, they have got to find a way to hold on to the ball. You know, Rule said in the postgame interview that he visited with Eric Crouch, and Eric Crouch brought up to him that Nebraska led the nation in fumbles in 1999, which would have been Crouch's uh, sophomore season. And basically the point was, it's okay, Coach. We fumbled back in 99, too, <laughs> and that was a big Big 12 championship team. Well, the difference is that 1999 team, you know, not only had the future Heisman Trophy winner at quarterback, but it had incredible players on the defensive side like Mike Brown and Ralph Brown and great pass rushers and very good running backs. And it's just not this, – this is not a team that can, that can uh, make up for those kind of mistakes. They have to be more mistake-free than 1999 Nebraska. And by the way, 1999 Nebraska wins a national championship if it doesn't have a fumbling problem. Exactly. In was, Austin. There in Austin. was one loss in that season in Austin where a fumble at the goal line cost them the opportunity to win. And if they win that game, it's uh, probably five in seven years. Mm-hmm. Four, in seven, four in six years. Yeah. You are speaking to me about that 99 team and season because that was a, a year full of fun road trips, and you had two fumbles inside the 10 in that third quarter. Nebraska's up halftime on Major Applewhite, that Texas team. They get even with them, of course, because the, the defense was easy to read, says Major Applewhite, during the rematch in the Big 12 championship game. But... Uh, Arizona, potential bowl destination for Nebraska Fiesta Bowl appearance that year for Nebraska. And what I love that team. They didn't have the guaranteed rate bowl in 99. They, they did not, <laughs> <laughs> I wish. But, yeah, we got Peter Warwick in Florida State versus Michael Vick in Virginia Tech. But I would love to see Nebraska bookend the title runs, I potentially. Love re- I love your recall of 99. That was a special year for you. No, it was. It was yeah. – it was, uh, yeah, I was at um, – I was at that. Uh, Did you go to Cal that year? I didn't go to Cal. I went to okay. I went to Austin with cousin Dino, and we played beer pong with the Bush twins because they were neighbors <laughs> with my cousin. Nice. And and then went to Lawrence the following week. The the hangover hangover mm-hmm. of all hangover games where that Texas what? game was going to beat you twice till Bobby Newcomb put on his Superman cape, and uh, yeah, then went down to the festival that year. So was it, it was it was good. It was a special year for me too. Yeah, because you were born. I was born that year. Yeah. <laughs> First ever Husker season. I don't remember it, but <laughs> it, it was it was memorable. They could have won it, and Steve Peterson still would have fired Frank. So no, I know, I know. Not to get too crazy here, but no, I mean, uh, Arizona's my pick for a bowl de- destination, and uh, I'd be yeah, happy the, with that. The forty nine fumbles with that defense, time and time again, that defense, Mitch, to your point on the ninety nine season, came out and didn't care. This team comes out doesn't care either. There is a, there is a correlation. There. Yeah. And, and, the, and that's why they can win defense. games. Yeah, that's I, the only way you can win games and overcome 24 fumbles in eight games, 11 lost, plus a bunch of interceptions. The only way you can do that is to have a defense and a special teams. Now they're starting to develop a special teams with a little bit of an edge to them. How about the field goal block? Bounces into the hands of Quentin Newsom, <laughs> High five and his boy Tommy Hill down the sideline. You know, Tommy wanted to high five Quentin at the 30. <laughs> he, was, he had his left hand up. I thought he was going to knock him out of bounds. And Q's like, dude, we got you know, to get a little closer to the end zone before I high-five you. And then, and then hilariously, Matt Rule didn't know about it. He found out about it during the press conference after the game and said he did what? And then today he, he did confirm that he yelled at those guys. And his wife called him a jerk 
for yelling at at Quentin and Tommy. The the story the point here is that these guys are having fun. Yeah. You know, the coach is having fun. He's telling stories. They're high fiving down the sideline. It looked like nineteen eighty eight Oklahoma State all over again, a track meet with Barry <laughs> Sanders and hundred plus points put up in the stadium. I know that wasn't how this game looked, but when they're high fiving going down the sidelines, I had visions of that. They're having fun on special teams. They're having fun on defense, and they're fumbling on offense. So <laughs> one thing needs to be fixed. And w- uh, which reporter outed those two to rule? It was Sam McEwen. Ah, uh, I was because I, I saw it online, and I, I didn't get a chance to actually like, try to listen in and see who it was. So a, a reporter outed them. I was Sam I was a little out. surprised that that wasn't a penalty for a celebration and but I don't it think it was really it wasn't taunting, taunting, taunting I know I know but well let's say hey, let's face it excessive celebration we, we, <laughs> that's the definition <laughs> we we look I've seen better football officiating in the Class C two quarterfinals sub district game than what we saw at Memorial Stadium on and that, Saturday that's a credit to the state of Nebraska officials oh, yeah well, <laughs> this you know, I thought Saturday's game was rough. poorly managed. Um, by the by, the officiating crew, and wow. maybe they maybe they didn't see them high fiving um, going down the sideline either. Maybe they didn't know that that should have been an excessive celebration rule. I, I don't know, but I I was a little surprised that there wasn't a flag, and I thought oh, how, how t- typical would that be that they do this and they're going to get a field goal out of it. I've never seen a game where they overturned two fumble recoveries, Mm-mm. let alone oh, one fumble recovery on the, the opening kickoff. They they switched it on the review who recovered the fumble and then later how? I don't know how do you even do that like it, it, isn't it just basically who comes away with the ball and you bottom have your, of the pile right right and you and you as an official you see player A with the ball so his team has possession but they ruled that the ball had been recovered and then apparently changed hands after it was re- I, I don't I still am not quite sure on how those those two reviews worked where they ch- where, where possession changed via the review on a fumble recovery you had two of those. You had a couple of targeting penalties that, Absolutely. that were botched. One, um, <laughs> Harburg got got targeted and they didn't call it. Yeah. I'm I'm misremembering, but I, I just they, I, they called it on the field and they overturned it I, after review. Right, I do recall. And then and then the the hit by Kydron Jenkins that we referenced earlier in the mm-hmm. show, where it was a blindside hit, no 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 fault of the defender. Harburg's eyes were down the field. That looked to be textbook targeting like helmet right under the chin of the quarterback and you know he came to the sideline with blood pouring out of his mouth as as evidence of that but um, I agree not 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 great officiating and you know the thing is that's not the main talking point that's not the thing that everybody in the state of Nebraska was talking about on Saturday night was how bad the officials were because they won the game by 17 points and that's the, been the issue all of these years where we've heard Oh man, the officials, they cost Nebraska the game. This was terrible. This was terrible. It ends up being kind of an afterthought. Like we get into it 20 minutes into the show because they took matters into their own hands and did mm-hmm. things to win the game that made it so the officials' bad calls didn't matter. It's different. It's different this year and it's different than past years. And it's part of this process rule talks about where the offense, all right, what, what did they show you on Saturday? They showed you. Some big play capabilities uh, to go along with those fumbles. They they did make their own breaks in some instances. You had a thirteen play, eighty seven yard drive. You had a uh, all right. Let's ice the thing with a twenty eight yard touchdown run by by Emma Johnson, uh, which was big. And then between uh, the hilarity and and in insecurity with ball security, you had defense that just balled and took took the football away and. This team's finding ways to handle it, handle their business despite themselves when it would cost them games, and it has cost them all those tight ball games over the years. And can I pose the question to you guys? Were you surprised to hear? I don't want to call it how critical Matt Rule was to the defense, but he came up in in his Monday presser this week and said, "You know what? Upon watching the film, I wasn't as happy with that defensive performance as I was following the game." And you've heard that from coaches before. It's never as good as you think. It's never as bad as you think. Mm-hmm. One coach in particular stands out, but I was surprised to hear him say that because I look at the defensive performance and was it perfect? No, but you held him to well, how many total yards was it? Somebody under two hundred. It's the first mm-hmm. yeah under two hundred. First opponent to go under a hundred in rushing and in passing since two thousand twelve. Yeah, and, and then you look at the points scored. One or I guess both really were, were on the offense, yes. setting up Purdue with a short field once and the second time a scoop and score. If your offense doesn't shoot itself in the foot, Nebraska might have pitched a shutout. Yet Matt Rule. 
gets up on Monday in front of the media and says, I wasn't as happy with that defensive performance as I thought I'd be. But so were you guys surprised by this that? This is him just continuing to, to use the media to his a- advantage, to use that, that stage, that platform, to his advantage to send a message to his team that they've always got to continue to raise the bar. You know, it's never, it's never going to be good enough. When you've reached the point where it's good enough and you still have three losses on your, on your ledger, I mean, even if they were 8-0, they're far from being 8-0. But even if this was an 8-0 team, I think he would still be coming out with these messages where he's saying, hey, that was that looked nice, but it wasn't good enough. So I, you're, it's going to be a continued theme from Matt Rule in the years ahead. He'll always say, I think, that it, it's more likely that he's going to, to say what he said on Monday, that I think it could have been a lot better, it wasn't as good as it looked, when they're actually playing well, then he's likely to say that if they go out and – you know, lose a game like they did at Minnesota, then I think he's more into building confidence with the team. One thing that uh, he cannot, I really, I don't think he can necessarily criticize his defense for is is the effort and the attack. Sure. And it is, you know, something that uh, we've talked about from the beginning of the season when people are wondering, well, what about the three three five, and how's that going to, uh, you know, be adaptable to the Big Ten Conference? And look, defense is simple. There's the ball. Go hit the guy with the ball really, really hard. Get there as fast as you can and finish off the play. And for the most part, this defense is relentless. It attacks. And the side-to-side game, if anybody tries to implement that on that defense, it's nearly impossible. Not completely, but where Michigan rolled Nebraska after getting its signs down was going straight up the middle. And just and just turning out five, six, seven, eight yards. They knew and, the entire playbook. And, and they knew the playbook. But when if it, when teams try to go sideline to sideline, that's basically all the farther they get is they get to the sideline and a play gets made. You do not see uh, this Nebraska team not have a gang tackle uh, near a bench. It's mm-hmm. it's a, without without doing that. So that's what's impressive. I think when he when he wants to criticize this defense, it's about how well did we dot the I and where did we cross the T, because everything else for the most part is a lot of fun to watch. It's violent football, which is the way defense should be played, and it's a defense that is worthy of being black shirts. And I don't think you can, you could have said that about some of the past Nebraska defenses in the last ten years or so. Yeah, some of his issues with QB contain and Hudson Card did get loose a couple of times, but he's a good athlete. You know, as Matt Rule told everybody last Monday, this was a he was a wide receiver in high school, and he's a guy who's mobile, and they were going to have to watch, and and he got loose a couple of times, and but, he made some plays, but. It wasn't. It wasn't over the top. Purdue was one of eight on third down in the second half. So, I I, I don't really have any issues with the way the Nebraska defense played on Saturday. What I saw when Hudson Card would run around and it looked like he was picking up big yards, it was typically after dropping back seven, mm-hmm. scrambling around a little bit, and the next thing you know, it's a, a three yard gain. Yeah, he ga- he runs for eleven, but he doesn't pick up. You know the necessary yards to make it second down and short or third down and short. He was always getting, having to scramble to get those uh, three or four yard gains. One thing I thought I really thought from this game was Nebraska outcoached Purdue, mm-hmm. and, and I haven't come out of uh, a, a, all that many games in recent years. There have been a few, and, and, and I would even say this year I haven't come out of all that many games thinking that that there was a mismatch on the sidelines or in the press box in that game, and, and I, I think there was. I think both sides. For Nebraska, thoroughly outcoached the 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 Purdue side, and and Graham Harrell, I think bringing his spread, um, Mike Leach, air it out principles into the Big Ten as you get close to the month of November is going to be something that Purdue is going to have to look at really hard in future years because it's it's not really the kind of offense that's set up to succeed in the Big Ten. Matt Rule talked this week about some of the differences between the coaching in the Big Twelve where you, you were silly not to go four, four wide every play, and the Big Ten, where physicality, um, tough, hard-nosed football, line play, all paying attention to the elements, knowing the wind, all of these things are, are, are so important. To me, Purdue didn't come in equipped for that part of the game. And on the defensive side, you know, Tony White's been doing it all year, and I think we saw it again Saturday. It's interesting, to your point about the, the out-coaching, where Purdue's calling a deep shot play into the wind, yeah. where Repeatedly. Nebraska hit the brakes and said, let's use the wind at our back. Harburg, uh, of course, found Lloyd for that big 73-yard touchdown. Wind at their back. Same shot play, same big play. Let's go downtown. But you had one staff and one offense go into the wind with it, resulted in an interception. 
uh, Nebraska was patient, set it up, and uh, and got the uh, the second touchdown off of it. So, a uh, good point there with um, the the out coaching. Uh, you know, I look at Nebraska as well, and in the couple of guys, he he always talks. Matt Rule does about Tommy Hill, and he continues to be on a bit of a heater as he's been a an afterthought on on a past staff just because you know there was probably some things Tommy needed to do better and probably there's some things that the defensive side of the ball needed to do better with him so he was a guy you're always kind of waiting on to live up to the star power Mm -hmm. you flip it around Jamari Butler Mm -hmm. I think he flipped the game early on where okay Nebraska fumbles it the defense gets a stop what happens next well you get Butler hustling and then stripping from behind and forcing a fumble there, uh, mm-hmm. which was really big early on in that ball game. It kind of took a little wind out of Purdue's sails, I think. The Tommy Hill thing's kind of uncanny. It's kind of like the mad scientist at work <laughs> with Matt Rule on that one, because I've been wondering all year as he's been praising Tommy Hill and, and, and heaping more praise yeah, on him. What's he seeing, right? Yeah, like where's this coming from? And I recognize he sees practice and we don't, and he knows the guy uh, and his personality extremely well. But he, he read Tommy Hill like a book, and I think that, that he was working to get something out of him that we hadn't seen, but Matt Rule knew was there. And then he comes out here in the eighth game of the year and gets two picks. And I also would not play down the significance, the, the, the impact that Tommy Rule has ha- Tommy Hill has had on Tommy Rule. Tommy Hill has <laughs> He had, likes him that much. Yeah, start calling him Tommy Rule the way Matt Rule's taking him under his wing. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't downplay the significance that Tommy's had on Quentin Newsom's game. Mm-hmm. And you see those two come up and do their interview together on Saturday after the game. These two are tight, and they motivate each other. And what did Quentin have on Saturday? He had a fumble recovery. He had a kick return, taken a, 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 a kick blocked, blocked field goal taken back for a touchdown with Tommy as an escort. And then he had a key pickup on a muffed punt. Alex Bullock muffs mm-hmm. a punt. And this isn't officially a fumble recovery in the stats, but it's every bit as important as a fumble recovery because Quinton was there on the spot, and the ball just kind of popped out right to him. These are the things that happened to Nebraska, that happened against Nebraska <laughs> for game after game after game after game. But there's Quinton Newsom just waiting because he's in position, because he's hustling. He gets the ball, preventing Purdue from having a short field. That was at the 13-yard line. Nebraska turns around, goes 87 yards in 15 plays, takes almost nine minutes off the clock, a game defining drive right there to, to unlock a scoreless tie. And it doesn't happen if Quentin Newsom isn't there waiting behind the ball in position just in case he's able to recover that muff. And I think Tommy Hill's got something to do with that. I think Tommy Hill's pushing, pushing Quentin Newsom to be better every time he goes on the field. And Newsom, to his credit, coming back to Nebraska for this season, he, he could have gone, but he, he, he decides he wants to stick around with Matt Rule, give it a shot. He has done himself uh, a world of good for what his stock will be next spring when the draft rolls around. Yeah. Will he get drafted? Uh, probably. I think is, he will. is he going to be a high high ranking uh, defensive pick? I, I don't know, but he has done himself a world of good uh, by what he's done so far this season. And I think Tommy Hill, who is also a junior and has been around the college game a while, I, I would think that maybe Tommy Hill looks at that and says, "You know what? Maybe it's." It's best that I stick around for another year. Could be. And as much as Matt Rule, you know, enjoys having him around, um, uh, Tommy Hill might be a, a real leader for this defense uh, a year from now. Two things. The awareness uh, of a guy uh, like Quentin Newsom. He, he's always had talent, right? And and he's been the kind of the respected corner in Nebraska's defen- defensive secondary for a while. But it's the little things and the awareness, being in the right spot for a field goal block return or being there to jump on a, on a loose fumble that squirts out of a pile. Those are things that who knows if, if Quentin Newsom would have paid attention to that much detail and, and been where he's supposed to be okay. on, on a special teams play. Uh, and I want to say this in the run game. He is so good now at coming in, getting off a block, and sealing the edge and being active in run support. He's a really good tackler, and I'm not just saying this for a cornerback. He's a good tackler in, in, a, in, a, in a third level form. He, he attacks and tackles like he's a, he's a safety or a rover coming down, but he's a physical corner, and, and he is a difference maker when it comes to 
not passing up or making a business decision like you see so many corners make. Well, and, and one of the things about Quentin Newsom that I've said this year is, is sometimes the biggest credit that, that you can give a corner on the field is that it was quiet. He didn't seem to make too many plays because nobody wants to throw his way. And that's been the story of Quentin Newsom. I feel like, for a lot of this year, especially since that Colorado game. The Colorado game's the last time I think I remember a team really trying to, to go after Newsom more than the other teams have. But he's been quiet for a lot of the year. But Saturday, he didn't have a quiet game. And it wasn't in coverage necessarily that he made a whole bunch of plays. He found a way to get his name on the stat sheet, though. And, and you can just see a guy like him getting better. You can see Tommy Hill getting better game after game. And is there... Right now, I mean, there's some candidates, but is there a better candidate for the development of Matt Rule and his coaching staff than Tommy Hill with the development that he made? I mean, last year, Husker fans hated seeing Tommy Hill on the field. I mean, you felt like every single time he was out there, he was giving up a, a big play. And, and I don't mean to harp on the kid, but he's made such a turnaround this season that you feel confident whenever he goes out there that he's going to go out there and he's going to make a play. He's going to go get himself an interception. His year-to-year progress from last year to this year has just been incredible. And the way the staff has been able to unlock the athleticism, which has always been there, and turn that guy into a football player has been really incredible. He's right now, in my opinion, the face of what Matt Rule's development has been in his first year at Nebraska. I mean, I'd say that, but I'd say how about uh, Jamari Butler? Oh, yeah. How about Nash Hutmacher? How about Phelan Sanford? How about Justin Evans Jenkins? Mm. What about Alex Bullock and his brother John Bullock? Both of them. How about Heinrich Harburg or Emmett Johnson? I mean, these guys are all over the field, these players who are, are showing improvement through the season. And that's the thing I think that Nebraska people, Nebraska fans have to take into consideration. You see the flaws with this team, but if you, if you stop and you look at the players who are improving, not just from last year, but the players who are improving from August 31st to October 31st, here we are, it's two, not even two months since the opener, or just at two months since the opener, and... There are players all over the field who are noticeably better than what they were at the start of the year. That's encouraging for, for, uh, for 2024 and beyond. So we're 30 minutes into this, uh, and we have not mentioned the makeshift offensive line. Yeah. I mean, last week that was – that was, <laughs> uh, the, was the, the talk. <laughs> that that yeah. was – last week this was should Nebraska drop football. Yeah. Uh, and now this week nobody's talking about the reason why there was such panic and paranoia in the capital city. All of these offensive linemen are gone, and, and I, I said my biggest concern with with that was okay, who's behind the guys who will start? What kind of depth is there now? And I think that still has to be somewhat of a concern. But you know, Prohaska has been a starter, and Ben Hart. Nobody talks about Ben Hart anymore. He was the Trolls' favorite uh, target on the internet last year, and nobody's talked about him. And he's been out there uh, as many games at, at what right tackle since Zach Wiegert, right? Mm. Not the same player, but he's been consistent. And Jenkins comes in and plays well. Uh, Scott shows a lot of heart and plays through injury. So that offensive line on Saturday did everything possible to make sure that they were not a topic of conversation this week. And I would say mission very well accomplished. There's confidence there, guys. And Rule talked about that. Really, you got to go back to the Illinois game where they just kind of put the earmuffs on. Just kept on trucking, and guys that weren't starting kept preparing. Either they got healthy or they got the reps to to put themselves in position to, if they were called upon, be ready. So far, so good. Uh, It'll be a different animal in East Lansing, potentially. But there's a game under their belt as a unit you got to feel good about. You still, despite a low offensive performance day, you still knocked out your 75, make it 76 rushing yards in the fourth quarter for Nebraska. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's a goal for Matt Rule all the, way, all the way around is to get 75 rushing yards in the fourth quarter. And you know what? When they get there and they're averaging 75 in the fourth quarter, they'll say we got to get 100. That'll be, that's just going to be the, uh, um, the MO Raise with this up. program is to just continue to, to, uh, to raise the bar. Let's uh, jump in and talk quarterbacks. You're listening to the Average Joe Sports Show. YouTube can find it, the AJ Sports Show, or Twitter, the AJ Sports Pod. Mitch Sherman with The Athletic. Bill Dolman, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. And let's uh, get into Harburg. I know we've talked fumbles. Uh, we've also talked uh, turnovers. We can get into the toughness part. But, but Mitch uh, Sims is a guy that got brought in, and it went from bad to worse for Sims as – Rule still has his back, which you'd expect, but Sims is a guy that needs something good to happen when called upon next time. Yeah, I kind of feel like 
we're going to end up closing the book on on Jeff Sims. And I mean, not to say that there isn't a scenario where he could come in and be placed in an important position for Nebraska over these last four games. And you've seen Harburg and the beating that he's taken on the field. And it's very, very possible, if not likely, that he's going to get knocked out at some point, if, if not for a game, but for, for, a, for a quarter or for a couple of series. And then the ball goes to Jeff Sims. But I kind of feel like I've seen, I've seen enough to make mm-hmm. a – uh, make a, a, a per, draw a pretty good conclusion about how this is going to go down and how we're going to look back at this. And it didn't work out. They they took a chance. They they went for they went for somebody in the portal on the recommendation of a, a former colleague of Matt Rules and Jeff Collins, the the ex Georgia Tech coach. And I think a lot of people at Nebraska thought that they could bring something out of Jeff Sims that. He hadn't shown in his three seasons at Georgia Tech, and now we're eight games in. He had two starts under his under his belt. He's come in 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 a brief relief role a couple of times for for Harburg at home, and you know you're kind of over four in that in that scenario overall. Each one of those situations has not worked out the way that Nebraska would like to see it. So he he's continuing to be a good teammate and Matt Rule highlights that how he came off the sideline after the touchdown pass to Malachi Coleman against Northwestern and was the first guy to celebrate with with Harburg but you know with what they invested in him and I don't mean financially that's an NIL thing that's outside of the hands of the Somebody coaches. else did that. Right. But what what they invested in him uh, in, in this program time-wise and, and just the commitment to make him the starter from really the day he was recruited, it's it's not worked out. And, you know, this has ramifications going forward that we can talk about maybe after we finish with this conversation because how are they going to attack this the next time they have to go into the portal to find a quarterback. But um, the Jeff Sims experiment, I think it's about over. So we put him in the uh, footnotes of history with Sam Keller, Tristan Jebbia, Harrison Beck. Yeah, it did not work out. But – to his credit, Jeff Sims' credit, those single-digit jerseys are voted on by the players. Yeah. So he did have his teammates' respect for the way he went about his business upon arriving on campus, going through uh, winter conditioning, spring football. He emerged as a leader on the team, and you're right. He has shown enthusiasm that is admirable when things go well for all of his teammates, including Heinrich Harburg. So tip of the cap there. So, but... Uh, what does Nebraska do? Is this is, is Sims now on the shelf the rest of the way? Is Purdy now perhaps going to get an opportunity to, to be uh, Harburg's backup? We don't know if Sims and uh, Purdy will even be around next year. So does Nebraska try to give them some snaps to showcase what they might be able to do elsewhere? Well, I don't think Nebraska is going to give them an audition, you know, unless it's a uh... Uh, 45 to 10 game right. um, or it's by injury well right. yeah that's the other thing is what if, if Harbor continues to take the Shador Sanders like beating <laughs> although probably Shador Sanders light beating uh, then who, who comes in there is no offensive line that's quite as bad as the Colorado oh offensive my God. line. Oh, yeah. 42 sacks a lot this year yeah, yeah it's an interesting it's it's a it's a tough a tough deal because Harbor you know he's laying it all out there and putting his body on the line every week, and right now behind him, I just don't have the enough. Com- I don't have the confidence in in the backup in Sims. And you know, Matt Rule continues to say that they have trust in Chubba Purdy, and he's ready to go. But we've not seen it on the field. He hasn't had the opportunity on the field. So I wouldn't be shocked if the next time, if there is a next time, that they have to go to the backup in a in a moment in a, in a pinch, like we saw. Saturday in the fourth quarter, if they don't give, I wouldn't be surprised if they if they don't give Chuba um, a shot. To, Hol- to holding see on to the got. football would be a positive step forward in that position. Yeah, because Sims comes in and, and when he fumbled against Purdue, it was almost it was almost a mirage. Like this can't be happening again, oh. and it did. There was a gasp. There was just a it, 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 what. I haven't heard that noise come out of the crowd <laughs> in, in, in a while. It was like a mixture of. Surprise and shock and oh no, it's happening again. I can't believe did that. Is, was the, no, that can't be real. That that kind of a thing. There was almost a little bit of comedy in it from when I was watching. From and I'm watching yeah. at home. It's it's different yeah. than being in, a little bit of that too in, in the cold. But there's that that almost that comedic element of 
Yeah, okay, I should have seen that one coming. It was a weekly thing the last five years. And this is of, the worst case scenario, fellas, and it still happened. And part of it was the circumstance because Nebraska had a fourth and one. They tried to draw Purdue off sides. They didn't. They took the false the, the, the delay a game. They punted. Purdue was penalized <laughs> yes. on the punt. Back to fourth and one. So you could have declined the penalty and just put the punt where it was inside the 20 or around the 20. But they said, nah, let's go for it on fourth and one. We were the Benny Hill music. Right. We weren't going to do this a minute ago, but let's go for it on fourth and one now. Oh, fumble, touchdown, Purdue. Yeah, there is some comedy in that. You're stopped, you fumble it, and they return it, and it's like, then it gets tight. Then it's like, okay, does Purdue get this momentum? Does this train get back on track? I think people were relieved when they looked up at the clock, though, and saw like 640 to go. And well, that's, a, that's an eternity. Uh, that's that's, that's, that's know, where my but, head but was. Still, you know, if I, it had been six six minutes in the third quarter, yeah. Yeah, that, that probably would yeah, have been. It, it should be noted, according to the ESPN win projection model, which there's always some funny ones whenever a 99% win turns into a loss, but Nebraska in that moment went down to about a 94% win chance. So mm-hmm. with the, the time considered, wasn't that great a blow, especially considering what Nebraska's defense was doing on Saturday. I think that defense, whenever you have a lead, Husker fans are always going to feel pretty solid about that lead because the defense is apt to giving up long drives, especially in pressure moments. They get to pin their ears back whenever Purdue is going to be throwing the football. You always feel good about what that defense is going to be doing, and ESPN's model felt about the same on Saturday. I think next time Matt Rule gets in that situation where he's up three scores, 24-6, to six, in the fourth quarter with an opportunity to punt and pin the opponent oh, down, punt. Uh, he's going to just go right ahead and do that. Yeah. <laughs> screw, screw the analytics. This Husker Get offense defense on the analytics. field. Yeah, our <laughs> offense is doing too much to keep other teams in the game. Let's put the defense back out there. Well, the the one silver lining of the pucker factor may, be, becoming twenty four <laughs> to to fourteen was the offense got did get to go back out on the field, line up in the I formation, and finish it running the football. They they got to go out there and Johnson finished it out. So. Um, I guess you're gonna you're gonna look at that if you're rule in the offensive line and be positive, right? Uh, pretty good moment for John for for Emmett as well. It was great. It was a great moment for Emmett Johnson and for Harburg. I think even though he didn't do much on that drive other than hand off, he had one carry for two yards, but otherwise he handed off to Emmett Johnson. It's it's a great confidence boost for the mm-hmm. offensive line mm-hmm. for everybody who was out there. To, and, and I think to see. Harburg come back out and be able to steady the ship because he's the one who has to go into the huddle and call the plays, and they can see. I mean, we could see it 45 minutes later in the interviews. He was having a hard time talking. I I don't know if he bit his tongue or exactly where the the blood was coming from on that that play from earlier, but it's still something was still off. He was still messed up when when he came in an hour after that happened um, and 45 minutes or so after the, the leading the last drive. So the teammates, your teammates can see that when he's in the huddle and he's trying to call a play and he's spitting out blood. And, and you know, that's, hey, that's, that's, uh, that's motivational. That's inspirational. That's the kind of stuff that, um, you know, turns a quarterback, you know, regardless of his talent, into somebody who's got some, some legendary qualities. It's big, and uh, Nebraska will pack that defense, that special teams unit, and uh, the run game uh, on the road to East Lansing. We'll have another pod later in the week to give a little more in-depth on Sparty and uh, Nebraska as the Big Red tries for six and uh, beyond. Michigan State tries to avoid their free-for-all. This is the Average Joe Sports Show, episode 13 at AJ Sports Show on YouTube and Twitter, the AJ Sports Pod. Guys, uh, some weekend thoughts real quick. I'm going to beat my chest publicly. (laughs) <laughs> and just say, how about them uh, Kansas Jayhawks, Coach Lance and company? Uh, I got scoffed at. I got laughed at. That's okay. I really didn't believe myself. But I'll take the uh, the win here, calling KU with the outright win. Are you uh, in favor of tearing the goalposts down and dumping them in the lake? I, I have not visited that part of Lawrence in a long time. The the, the, the bottom lake, of the lake? The bottom of the lake, or the, the lake in general. <laughs> I'm not quite sure where where that lake is, but I've got fond memories of being a, a youth and visiting Lawrence on some Saturdays. So, Are there a lot of goal, goal posts in that pond? That's I think that's where you take it. That's, but, the, that's the history. I know, there. but how many are there down there? How, how many coral reefs are they building in a pond uh-huh. off the Lawrence I, campus? Uh, maybe There's maybe three or four sets uh, in the okay. pond. They did it, they, I think they did it against Nebraska in 07. Yeah, they should have. 
Yeah. They, they clearly hit the over and covered that game. Uh, did, so, Did you guys see how much of a struggle it was on Saturday for them, for them to actually get the goalpost down? Because it, it was at the time, Nebraska was flipping from FS2 to FS1. Nebraska goes to a commercial break. They come in and show the, the goalpost going down in Lawrence. They were struggling. It's been a while. They were out of practice getting those goalposts down. It took them a good five minutes where these things are like listing over. They're, they're half over and more people keep on hopping on and people keep on falling off. They really struggled to get those things down. The whole team was off the field by the time they finally got the goalpost down, but they, they did eventually get them down and a large cheer was erupted, but can I struggle ask, for sure. Can I ask a favor? And the, the next time you storm the field as a fan... Keep your your phone's going to be out, but don't go up and try. This is a new phenomenon. And get Kellen Houston. Okay, this, is, this has happened. This happened in Notre Dame yeah. after the Ohio State game, right? It happened with a Notre Dame didn't, player. Uh, didn't some LSU player lose his mind too? Maybe Earlier happened this year. LSU, and then it happened to an Oklahoma player yeah, with the, a Kansas the, fan. The OU kid kept walking, bless his heart. He didn't do anything. No, yeah. re, no reaction. And good for him. Should have. Do we think this is a new phenomenon, or do we think this is just able to be documented now with camera phones? Well, I think the, the, the whole thing is the phone. I think the whole yeah. thing is the phone because mm-hmm. the kid's got the phone and he's and he's on himself. He's on the player. I, I I don't know that I don't know what the point of even doing this. I guess if you don't have a phone to record it, did it ever actually happen? That's that's how today's mm-hmm. uh, college kids view it. I think. The LSU Ole Miss. I'm old. I'm old man. Ole, Ole Miss. Ole Miss frat frat boy got knocked the yes. bleep out by LSU guy. Yeah. But OU OU was it a wide out so safety? I forget who it was, but KU puke sitting there just absolutely asking. And it for was it. Caleb Williams. It was Caleb. It was not Ohio State Notre Dame. It was Notre Dame USC. Yes. Ah, After yeah. Notre Dame knocked mm-hmm. off mm-hmm. USC, they got in Caleb Williams' face and asked him how he was going to paint his nails this time <laughs> or so, something to that effect. <laughs> It's it's ridiculous. I mean, mm-hmm. if you want to go on the field and party, fine. Stay away from the players. Please. Amen. But uh, good win, nevertheless, for Kansas. Yes. Uh, <laughs> not, not, a, not a great day for Oklahoma, who was thinking college football playoff. Still could. Uh, they, they still have an out, yeah, a chance, and, but that uh, their invincibility for the season is pretty much uh, out the window, which is right. uh, disappointing right. for the folks in Norman. But certainly... You know, a year ago, they're talking that Brent Venables was not uh, the guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were thinking that Joe Castiglione made a, a bad mistake and that uh, they needed to get rid of him after year one. Okay, so you lose to a pretty pretty decent Kansas football team. Uh, I would say that Venables has accorded himself very well, and Joe Castiglione made a good decision with that. There's nothing but good things going to happen for Oklahoma, and I think that even could, includes going on into the SEC. Oregon. Got over on Washington, Utah. So put the Ducks. That's a back. good You talk team. about a team, you know, you think you get knocked out of the college football playoff with one loss like we saw with the Sooners on Saturday. Um, Oregon's back in it. It's, it's pretty clear they're the best one-loss team in the country, at least from what I've seen. Whenever you put them up with Oklahoma, Texas, Ole Miss, Penn State, and I think there's an argument for Penn State as well, but I think Oregon's the best of the one-loss teams, and we're going to get the college football playoff rankings this week, so we'll, we'll get a, a yeah. more clear idea. Halloween about, night. But right now, like you have, is it, is it five undefeated teams right now with Ohio State, Florida State, Michigan, uh, who am I forgetting? Georgia. Georgia. Liberty. And uh, Washington. There's, Liberty. There, there's the Liberty. Five. Yeah. <laughs> James Madison. <laughs> are, are they going to be at the top of the rankings? Love that. I don't think so. But like right now, it's, it's setting up for two Big Ten teams to make it in. And who knows, maybe Oregon, they're going to need some help, I think, with, with a loss to, to try to get back in there. But the college football playoff rankings right now, they're interesting. I'm curious to see where the committee puts everyone. My pick of the weekend that wasn't quite a correct pick, but I did sense good things coming for Tristan Alvano uh-huh. in predicting that he was going to kick a walk-off field goal to beat Purdue. My, the, the, the sensors in my head, they were, they were getting a signal, but it, I, I just failed to decode it properly. Um, Tristan Alvano kicked a 55-yard field goal on that cold day with the wind in his back, and it had room to spare. True freshman from Omaha West Side. Good day for Omaha West Side with Jalen Lloyd and Tristan Alvano scoring for Nebraska. True freshman, um, but big, huge day for for Tristan Alvano. He has turned his season around after going through some struggles in September and a tip of the hat assist to ex Nebraska kicker Chris Brown, mm. who. Worked with Tristan in high school and has continued to work with him on occasion this year. And, and they got together after some of Tristan's struggles 
and uh, Chris helped uh, help fix some things mechanically. And, and here, here, Nebraska now has a guy as a true freshman making a 55-yard field goal. Really disappointed, though, in the media for not asking Ryan Walters, the Purdue head coach, which was more impressive, Alex Henry's 57-yard field goal or the a 55-yarder by Tristan Alvano? I'd like to have seen the reaction uh, to that. Uh, <laughs> There were few on the Purdue <laughs> sideline who witnessed both of those kicks, but the head coach did. There was one. <laughs> coach, uh, real quick, uh, which which was the more impressive kick? You two kicks yarder? I want to show you on my phone here, Coach. <laughs> which you was were, better? You were, you were here for this one. You were here for this one. <laughs> one north, one south with the wind. Freshman, you know, just, just want to get your thoughts real quick. Lo- the, lo- the louder roar, Mitch, was... <laughs> Was, was which Unquestionably one? for Alex Henry, because <laughs> yeah. that put Nebraska ahead and in the late stage of a game, and Tristan Tristan gave him a twenty four nothing lead. But that was a big. You, you are absolutely right. I mean, he is overall special teams. You, you've seen the defense really respond since Michigan, and you've seen special teams kind of catch up. Let's see if the offense is that third uh, phase. We know it is, but can they? Get into November with it may be uh, in a stronger. Well, it might be, <laughs> it might be. But I was encouraged by the explosive plays. Right. Yeah, the true freshman wide receivers are starting to show their speed. We've seen that two weeks in a row, and I think that'll be a theme through November. And now you can kind of do some things a little more creatively with the uh, with the red shirts because you're into the final four games of the season. <laughs> now the the skill players are already up there. In, in you know either either they're past the four game limit or they're right up on that edge like Jaden Doss, but what, I mean with like the linemen with like Sam Sledge and Gunnar Gatula or a guy like Quentin Ives in in the um, at the running back spot, you've got four games to play with now and you don't really have to worry about hey if we play him in this game then we can't play him in this game so it should do some things to create just a little bit more freedom and sense of uh, um, just having an ability to 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 do more on the offensive side as they as they go toward the end here. Can we mention real quick before we say goodbye about special teams with Nebraska, how important it is to have a dedicated and competent special teams coach and coordinator? Uh, I think Gosh, you, who would have thought that? I think <laughs> if you go back into the recent uh, chapter of Nebraska football where that was m- much more of an afterthought, if not a thought at all, uh, where they did not have somebody who was dedicated to that discipline of the game, uh, and that's pretty well known. And there was, you know, not even lip service really to special teams. Yeah. Uh, but now you have somebody in Matt Foley's dad, Ed, who has uh, <laughs> done a phenomenal job, really. And those guys love him. And Foley's done a great job of getting himself, uh, you know, established as, as a, I think, a de facto Nebraskan, the way he oh, barnstormed great. the state and, you know, had the old Milt Tenniper beer at every tavern and small town. <laughs> uh, I, I think that guy. I think that guy's a real gem. I think he's made a, a total difference with this team. And to see Matt Rule's expression after Tristan Alvano kicked that field goal, I think that uh, spoke volumes. They obviously they need to get you know somebody who is a really really good return guy. Billy yeah. Kemp was at least sure-handed. Yeah. Uh, we're longing for the days of Oliver Martin and his uh, fair catches at the ten yard line, uh, which no doubt is a career high for any re- return man in the country. But seeing Nebraska dedicated to special teams again uh, is vitally important. It's, I think it's a key reason why they won. Obviously on Saturday. Two, two final thoughts Ten on that. Ten points. Yeah. One. We're going to get the opportunity as a state and as, as the media on Tuesday to talk to Ed. He's going to, take his, <laughs> he's going to drive Matt's van out of the river and come into, come into the Hawks Championship Center and, and do an interview, a, a rare interview for a, a, he is a coordinator, but usually it's just the offensive and defensive coordinators in season. So Ed is going to, is going to grace us with his presence and answer some questions this week. So he's a treat. Good, it'll, it'll be good to hear from him. And two, if we could get a guest appearance at the, we're not going to, but if we could get a guest appearance at the media availability from George Darlington this week, I would like to do that because he apparently went into Matt Rule's office on Sunday and let the head coach have it about the way that they're returning punts. That's what Matt Rule said. He said, I heard about it from George Darlington. He came in and yelled at me. So we did we, too we, in the we, press yeah, box. Heard, George yelled, also Saturday. yelled at everyone in the press box Catch on Saturday. <laughs> I wanted to ask Rule, and maybe we'll get to this on Thursday, if George implored him to have two guys back returning punts because that's how George wants it done. Put two guys back there so they can't directionally kick, so you don't have to run a long distance. It's that simple, the, the, the ex-Nebraska secondary coach says. And, and credit to Matt Rule for just 
putting up with his crap and listening to the old coach come into the office well, and give it to him. We can get George on Thursday <laughs> to see what George says. I'm just imagining George rolling into Matt Rose's office, his best Hawaiian shirt's on. It's been ironed. It's been steamed. It looks perfect. And he goes in there and in his George Darlington way, let's rule have it, which is not, I'm sure, yelling. Because like, we've sat down with George, and I'm sure that, that meeting's probably a little it's, different it's than with us. West Virginia twang. Yes. It's so charming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> charming. You know, Char- is it charming? You know, when he, whenever he, <laughs> even if he insults me, hey, coach, well, that, that, you know, ask him a recruiting question. And it's that West Virginia twang. We were winning. <laughs> How hard was it to recruit a Riola from, from, uh, from the islands? We were winning. <laughs> He's got a great way of insulting like you, you without dumbass. making you feel bad. He's always got that smile easy. on his face. He was real easy, dumbass. <laughs> You're winning ball games. So. He's a one of a kind. I love him. Truly. All right. That is Mitch Sherman with The Athletic. Pride of Fairberry's Bill Dolman, Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt. Average Joe Sports Show back at you later this week. Subscribe to the AJ Sports Show on YouTube and also on Twitter, the AJ Sports Pod. Download Spotify and Apple. We'll talk to you next time.